Hi, this is part two of my series on how I made these photorealistic Desmos fractals. So if you haven't seen part one, I recommend that you check it out. It goes over the general outline of the series along with the ray marching algorithm itself. Anyway, this episode is on how to make a 3D renderer using ray marching. I'll first go over how the renderer works at a high level. Then I'll break down reflections, lighting, and last but not certainly least, piecing all that data together to create an actual image. So let's begin. Let's begin with our goal. We're trying to make photorealistic fractals here, so we should probably start pretty close to how light actually works in real life. Photons of light modeled by rays are casted out of the surface of a light source, reflect off of zero or more objects in the scene, modifying their color with each hit. And finally, some hit the camera sensor, producing a bright spot in those pixels. Sample enough rays and these bright spots average out to produce an image. Except this method of doing things sucks. Like, really sucks. This is because you'll notice that many of the rays miss the camera entirely. This sucks because all of this is computation we've done, yet none of this computation contributed a single pixel to the scene. Ideally, all of our rays would hit the camera to minimize all this pointless computation. For this to happen, we'll need to start with the rays we know will hit the camera. How do we do this? We need to work backwards. Instead of casting rays out of the light source and hoping they'll hit the camera, let's cast them out of the camera and hope they'll hit the light source. This process of ray reflection is mostly reversible, so your results will be just as if you started your rays at the light source, only in reverse. And by casting your rays in reverse, starting at the camera, you will know for sure that for all of your rays, if you actually casted them in the proper forward direction, they would hit the camera. So here's a general process summarized. We cast out a bunch of rays from the camera, each one corresponding to a pixel. They reflect off of one or more objects, whether they be light sources or not. And then based on the objects and or light sources hit, we color that corresponding pixel on the screen. Because this reflection process is highly random, we then repeat this a bunch of times per pixel, averaging out the results to get rid of noise. So that's the general process of what we're doing. Now let's talk about calculating reflections, because we're doing a lot of those. We'll talk about diffuse and specular reflections. We'll then talk about calculating normals. We'll then talk about calculating diffuse reflection rays. We'll then talk about calculating specular reflection rays. And finally, we'll talk about blending these two ray types together. Now onto the reflection types. There's two types we care about, diffuse and specular. Let's start with diffuse. View-wise, diffuse reflections give a matte finish. Reflection-wise, an incoming or incident ray can reflect in any direction. Now let's talk about specular. View-wise, specular reflections look like perfect mirror reflections. Reflection-wise, the incident ray is reflected at the same angle as the angle for which it entered. There's also a middle ground between the two, but I'll get to that later. Now on to normals. A normal is one of the two unique unit vectors that is perpendicular to a given plane, and is a compact way of representing the orientation of that plane. Here's a 3D model in Blender with all of its normals being shown in blue. As you can imagine, knowing what way a surface is oriented is kind of super very important for knowing how light reflects off of it. So how do we find normals? That's simple, just numerically approximate the gradient of our SDF at the intersection position and normalize it. If you don't know what a gradient is, you basically take the derivative of the SDF with respect to each component, shove all those derivatives into a vector, and use that as the function's output. If you don't know what a derivative is, it's basically a function f prime based on a function f, or given a value x, you zoom really, really, really far into f at x, treat it as a linear line, and use that slope of the line as the output of f prime. You're basically finding slope at a point. If you don't know what slope is, it's like if you have a staircase and divide the rise by the run. If you don't know what a staircase Okay, just use this formula. So why then can we get the normal by numerically approximating the gradient at the intersection point and then normalizing it? This is somewhat beyond the scope of this video, so I'll leave the proof for this as an exercise for the reader. Or should I say the watcher? Never mind. So we've covered normals, now let's calculate some diffuse reflection vectors. As I stated earlier, diffuse reflections go off in a random direction regardless of the direction of the incident ray. You might think that we could just choose three random numbers between negative one and one and then normalize them to get this random vector, but that won't work because the distribution will be non-uniform. Take a look at those diagonals. The solution is to pick our random numbers from a normal distribution before normalizing. We'd normally do this by using something like the box Muller transform, another exercise for the reader, but Desmos has normal distributions built in, so I won't bother. Except once we've done this, we still have reflection rays pointing into the scene. We can eliminate these rays by flipping them if they point into the scene. This can be done by multiplying them by the sine of the dot product of themselves to the normal. That sine is in positive or negative, not sine. Feel free to pause the video and figure out why this works. Anyway, to summarize, to get a diffuse reflection vector, normalize three random numbers taken from a normal distribution, and then multiply your vector by the sine of the dot product of itself and the normal. I used three different meanings of the word normal on that last sentence, wow. Okay, glad that's over with. On to specular reflection rays. Here's the formula for those. 
You can intuitively think of it like rescaling the normal to cancel out the normal component of the incident ray, and then adding two of those to the incident ray to get it pointing in the other direction. If you want to pause the video and think about that, how that works, then go ahead. Moving on. So what about blending diffuse and specular reflections together? There are many methods for calculating this, fine-tuned, handcrafted, and thoroughly researched algorithms created and optimized over generations to create the most eerily realistic reflections possible. And I'm not going to use any of them, I'll just mix the two vectors together and normalize. I can already hear the screams of all computer graphics researchers in the 100 kilometer radius. So that was reflections. Let's now talk about lighting. Now the lighting is a bit strange because we're doing everything in reverse. Let's start with a ray at the camera's position like we said we'd do earlier and have it reflect off of several objects. Every time a ray of light reflects off of an object, we need to keep track of that object's color, or albedo. This is so that when we inevitably hit an object that emits light, i.e. a light source, we can then calculate the lighting for that specific light source, as if the ray had originated there, and then reflect it off of all the previous objects of which we've been keeping track, and then add that lighting to what we already have. This might seem like a frustrating task. Do we have to store an array of albedos so that whenever we hit a light source we have to calculate contributions from every albedo? Actually, it's a lot simpler than that. See, I never actually told you how the color of light changes when it bounces off an object. Colors on computers are represented with red, green, and blue channels, typically ranging from 0 to 1, which are mixed together to form a color. This is how both light color and albedo are represented. When a ray of light bounces off of an object with a given albedo, the color channels of the light color are multiplied element-wise by the color channels of the object's albedo. Therefore, if on a reverse ray's journey, we hit a light source, it's as if the light is going back to where it came, getting its color multiplied by the albedo of all the objects we've encountered so far. Okay, here's where it gets simpler. We don't have to store an array of albedos. Instead, we keep track of a single multiplied albedo. This starts at 1, 1, 1 to represent the unfiltered light color. Then with every subsequent object hit, the multiplied albedo is multiplied by that object's albedo. Here's where the magic happens. Multiplication doesn't care about the order in which it happens. Let's say we hit a light source. We multiply by the list of albedos we created earlier to get the actual color of the light after it hits all those objects. Except this albedo list simplifies to that multiplied albedo we made earlier. So we can instead simply multiply by the multiplied albedo. Okay, okay, let's recap. We cast a ray out of the camera, keeping track of two quantities. The pixel color, which starts at 0, 0, 0, and the multiplied albedo, which starts at 1, 1, 1. Every time the ray hits an object, the multiplied albedo is multiplied by that object's albedo. Every time the ray hits a light source, take the light source's color times the multiplied albedo and add it to the pixel color. And as a reminder, these are vector quantities, and I know a lot of you are probably extremely frustrated that I'm talking about multiplying vector quantities together. To be clear, all these multiplications are done element-wise. R channel is multiplied by R channel, G channel is multiplied by G channel, B channel is multiplied by B channel. Simple. Alright, that's lighting done. Let's piece everything together so you can hear a cohesive explanation of how this rendering engine truly works. Pause if you need to do so. In this 3D rendering engine, you're drawing to a 2D grid of pixels. Imagine the grid of pixels as a rectangle in space. Imagine the rays you're casting out of the camera as originating at a point behind this rectangle, with their direction defined as the unit vector pointing through the pixel to which they correspond. Make sure to add a little bit of an offset to each ray so that it doesn't pass exactly through the center of a pixel. I'll explain why later. Now with these starting rays, you can cast them outward with the ray marching algorithm, performing diffuse reflections with this formula for the reflected ray, and specular reflections with this formula for the reflected ray. In the meantime, upon reflecting, remember to multiply the multiplied albedo by the object's albedo, and to accumulate light of the object as the light source. And once you reach some predefined limit for the number of reflections, I usually do between 3 and 6, set the pixel's color to the color you got from all that light accumulation, and you're done. Well, not yet, because the image you'll get will likely be very noisy. This is because the reflections, if not perfectly specular, are random, and thus only represent a tiny, random fraction of the possible paths a ray of light could take. So in order to get a better representation of the paths that light could take, and thus get a smoother, less noisy image, you need to simulate more rays of light per pixel and average out the resulting pixel colors, sometimes hundreds or even thousands for particularly noisy scenes. Okay, 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 now you're actually done. So that was part two of how I made my photorealistic Desmos fractals. Don't worry if you didn't understand it all. This is the culmination of months of learning and research on my part, so it's almost kind of silly to expect to know it all from a single short video. 
I'd also like to apologize for the long wait on this video. With Winter Break Vacation and the art contest and everything, I wanted to take it easy. Also, I appreciate the feedback I got on my audio. I hope I've sufficiently lowered the music volume on this video, which, by the way, for this one is a live recording of one of my own compositions. Anyway, thank you for watching. See you in part 3, where we can actually finally create 3D fractals.